All right, let's reconstruct some more words from Proto-Polynesian, the language that would have been the mother language to the Polynesian languages like Samoan, Tahitian, Maori, Tongan, and Hawaiian. So this is what we did in the last video. We had sets of cognates from different Polynesian languages. For example, for fish, we had ika, ia, ia, ika, and ia. These all mean similar things and have similar pronunciations, similar phonology. We used these to then make regular sound correspondences. We figured out that in all of the languages we saw, when we saw an M in Tongan, we also saw it in Samoan and Tahitian and so forth. And that this was a pattern that we observed in other words as well. This is particularly true for this K that we found here. That these are K, K, K in Tongan, which are always glottal, glottal, glottal in Samoan, glottal, glottal, glottal in Tahitian. So for all of these words in Tongan, whenever we see a K, we see a glottal in Samoan, we see a K in Maori, we see a glottal in Hawaiian, and so forth. These are regular sound correspondences because they apply to many words in a regular fashion. Um, from these regular sound correspondences, we made proto-Polynesian protoforms. So these are marked with an asterisk to mean that we didn't travel back in time to listen to Proto-Polynesian, which must have been spoken about 3,000 years ago. But we can assume that the word looks something like this because we can posit logical rules for how it could, tra could have transformed from Ika, term of Proto-Ika, to the other words that we see in the observable languages. Let's keep on going. So these are the sound correspondences that we have been able to find so far. Could you try to figure out the protoform for cry, for the verb to cry? Um, as you can see here, in Tongan it's pronounced tangi, tangi in Samoan, tai in Tahitian, tangi in Te Reo Maori from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Hawaiian, and kani in Hawaiian. So try to figure out what are the sound correspondences. Maybe we already have all, all the ones that we need. I don't think so. Figure out the, the correspondences and then try to reconstruct a protoform for to cry. Please pause the video. All right. So there was one set of sound correspondences that we hadn't seen before. The one that has an engma, a velar nasal in Tongan, Samoan, and Maori. And this velar nasal corresponds to the Tahitian glottal stop and the Hawaiian alveolar nasal N. So we have this set of sound correspondences uh, for the different languages. And we already knew that we have a, where we see a T in Tongan, Samoan, Tahitian, and Maori, we see a K in Hawaiian, and that for all of them, and they all have an A and they all have an E in the same positions. So what are we going to do with this sound in the middle? Let's just choose the one that we see more frequently as the basis for the proto sound, the velar nasal, the engma. So the proto form is going to be tangi. And then we have to posit a rule that says that when uh, in the transformation from proto Polynesian into Hawaiian, the T becomes a K and the uh, velar nasal becomes an alveolar nasal from tangi to kani. But you can see how we're going to have to pause the transformation rules for all of the languages. It's just that uh, this form resembles the Tongan one a lot. All right, that's how you reconstruct protoforms. But also notice that something really cool just happened. There was a merger. So there are in Hawaiian, Hawaiian, I'm sorry, has a phoneme N as in Manu and Kani. But this N does not always come from the same place. Some Ns in Hawaiian come from an N in Proto-Polynesian, like the N in Manu, bird. But some Ns in Hawaiian come from a velar nasal in Proto-Polynesian, like in Kani, Tangi, Kani. So we have two sounds in Proto-Polynesian that merged into a single sound in Olelo Hawaii, in Hawaiian. So N, N and Engma in Proto-Polynesian merged into Hawaiian N. This is called a merger. Cool stuff. 
So, all right, we have quite a bit of knowledge under our belt now. These are the correspondences that we have so far. We have the cognate set for bush, like in the mountains. Uta, 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 uka. Try to find the sound correspondences for bush. Don't reconstruct it yet. Just try to find the correspondences and be open to the possibility of there being things that are zero. Please pause the video. All right. So we already know that whenever we see a T in Tongan, we see a K in Hawaiian. So that one's good. Um, we have U, which I don't know if we've seen before, but we have that U in the middle of the word is U, 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 U for all of them. And that A at the end of the word is A, A, A for all of them. And there's a new uh, set of sound correspondences. When you have a glottal stop in Tongan, you have zero, 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 and zero at the beginning of the other words. So this is the correspondence set that we found. Here is something very interesting. It's easier to have a rule that, po that proposes deletion than to spontaneously create something out of nowhere. So uh, the rule is going to be that the glottal stop is deleted in all of the other languages. Because what would happen if we proposed it the other way around? We would have to say that out of nothing, a glottal stop is created. But if that, that is the case, why can't it create other things? If it's out of nothing, why can't it create a K or a P or a vowel and so forth? So creating something out of nothing is very complicated. It can lead to a lot of different paths, whereas deletion is much easier to explain. You had a global stop and then it disappeared. So we're going to say that the protoform had the global stop, uta, and that then this global stop was lost in Samoan, Tahitian, Maori, and Hawaiian. So this is the protoform, and then the glottal was lost in all of these other languages, but preserved in Tongan. All right. So now we have this set of sound correspondences and we get another uh, set of cognates. Tahi, tai, 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 kai, and, and all the mean C or C words. Um, what is the protoform for C? You give it a try. Please pause the video. All right. It's probably something like tahi. We have the T uh, in all the languages that becomes a K in Hawaiian. We already knew that. We have that they all have A and E for the vowels. And then we have another case of, some, of um, one sound, H, in Tongan, which is nothing in the others. So this is tahi, but they all have nothing in between the A and the E. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So we say that we have a proto-H that becomes zero in Samoan, Tahitian, Maori, and Hawaiian. Again, because it's easier to propose that something is deleted than having an H pop out of nowhere. So this would be the protoform for the word C. Wow, you've reconstructed a lot of proto-Polynesian. We have like eight words or something. So that is how the comparative method works. And I want to ask you one final question. These are words reconstructed from Proto-Polynesian. Try to take a look at them and then try to figure out what can they tell us about the culture of the Proto-Polynesians or the place of origin of the Proto-Polynesians. Do they come from big islands or from small atolls? Do they have agriculture? I'm sorry, did they have agriculture 3,000 years ago? Please pause the video. All right, they probably came from larger islands because they because we can reconstruct words like mountain, lake, stream, waterfalls. So these are things that small atolls in the middle of the ocean don't have. Um, so because we find the larger islands on the west of uh, Polynesia, like the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, and so forth, we find the larger islands there, and the more we go towards the east, we find smaller islands and more atolls. So uh, small islands like Tahiti, but also tiny atolls like Kiribati. So 
it's safe to assume that they probably came from the direction with the large islands where they had things like mountains, lakes, and streams, and then traveled in this direction. Because you wouldn't be able to reconstruct these words if they had originally lived in a place that had no mountains. They obviously had some form of agriculture and fishing because we can see that there's a lot of forms uh, for fish nets, for fishing, for planting, for spade and garden. So the words that we reconstruct can give us hints of the culture of the Proto-Polynesians from 3,000 years ago. In summary, again, when we do reconstruction, we prefer rules that are natural in language change. For example, if we, um, if most of the languages have a velar n, a velar nasal, I'm sorry, this is what we'll have in the proto language. We prefer rules that go from something to nothing, like h to zero. And in the next video, we'll study more types of sound changes in language.